answering and we'll be covering questions 31, 40 in this video. My apologies for a little bit of a hiatus with a lot of things going on in school. Graduation is a little bit hard to get into it. Now that we're back, hope to get these next three videos pumped out so I can help you, any of you guys doing this over the summer or even later on with the ACT math section. So without further ado, let's jump right into it and get into question 31. So question 31 asks us, the vector i represents one mile per hour east and the vector j represents one mile per hour north. Maria is jogging south at 12 miles per hour. One of the following vectors represents Maria's velocity in miles per hour, which one? So let's break it down to the four parts we say again. So what is this question asking us? Well, this question is really just asking us <clears throat> which one of these vectors represents uh, Maria going 12 miles per hour south in this case. And so let's kind of draw this out. What, would this, what does this all mean? Well, if I draw out kind of a vector plane or just a x, y axis, we see that vector i represents one mile per hour east. So that's x. And remember, new directions, never eat soggy waffles, or eat southwest. So that's i. And then one hour per hour north represents the vector j. So if I'm doing 12 miles per hour south, that would be down here at a vector of 12. And so since here, I'll be working with j in that case. And so I'm going down, so not positive. This would be negative 12 <coughs> miles per hour down um, in terms of south. And so it'd be negative 12 J. And so here, I'm gonna look at my answer. Does that make sense? <coughs> yep. So remember, I would be east, west. So that makes no sense. A would be wrong. Um, C, and that makes no sense to have E. And so then really, is it 12 J or negative J? And um, in this case, you're talking about south in this case. So it's gonna be negative. Awesome. Moving on, question 32. Four identical glasses are shown below. One glass is empty. The other three glasses are one fourth full, one half full, and four fifths full of water, respectively. If the water were redistributed equally among the four glasses, what fractional part of each glass would be filled? <clears throat> okay. So basically, I have none here. I have a quarter here, I have a half here, and then I have four fifths. So really, I'm just, it's asking us what fractional part of each class would be filled basically if I were to make this all equal. And so in this case, I'm making all equals. Another word you can find here is just saying the average. And so you have four of them. So I'd add everything up and divide by four. So I add one fourth plus one half plus four fifths. And in this case, you can use a calculator, find it and divide by four. Um, or you can also just do the fractional part here. Since I'm doing it by hand, I'll show you here. So the common denominator, is five times four is 20. You just kind of know that um, from multiplying and you know that two goes into 20, so that should be nice. So converting that, that'd be five over 20 plus 10 over 20 plus 16 over 20. And that all adds up to 31 over 20. Now it's 31 20ths of water and you want to divide this by four. So you can divide by four. And another way of dividing by four is the same thing as saying multiply by one fourth, right? Multiply by the reciprocal. And so this would get me 31 over 80. Looking at my S choices, that would be K. Now, does this make sense? Yeah, this is, you have a bit of water, so it would be too small to two elevenths. There's no way eight elevenths would be that full because this one's wholly empty. And so then you have these left. And then doing the math, you can check your answer for that to make sense. Great. Question 33, Aurelio is purchasing a carpet tile to cover an area of his living room that is eight one third feet wide and 10 feet long. Anytime I really see numbers, I like to say, like, okay, that's probably important. Each carpet tile is 20 square inches by 20 inches long. What is the minimum number of carpet tiles that Aurelio must purchase to cover this area of the living room floor? So what's the question asking us? It's asking us how many tiles does he need to purchase? So the number of tiles to cover the floor. And so in this case, the biggest thing to note here that many people will get caught up on is says inches by feet. So you really just want to choose one to con convert one to the other. It really doesn't matter. But before you do any kind of dimensional analysis, when you go squared, it gets very confusing. So I would just choose to convert one um, to the other. So in this case, I have my area would be eight and one, three feet wide by 10 feet long. So I'm just going to convert this. And so say, okay, if it's eight and one third feet, by 10 feet, I first going to convert this to inches. So that's a multiple multiplying by 12 because there's 12 inches in a foot. And so 
Here I'd have 120 inches now by eight times one third, which would be 100, right? And <clears throat> so it's 100 times 120. And so that'd be 112,000 inches squared. This is my area. And then now we have to divide it by the tiles. Notice I've now made it to inches so I can just find the area of the tile. So just put the tile here. Tile area is 20 by 20, so it's equal to 400. And so 400 inches squared, I'm gonna divide that 400 inches squared. And then from here, you can say that 12 divided by four is about, is three, and then you have the extra zero. So it's 30 tiles, right? And that relatively makes sense. If it's 20 inches by wide, but you're 20 inches wide, it's about like a foot and a half. And so if it's eight by 10, um, it's probably a little less than you know 80, so about, about half of that. It's around the 40 area, and that would make logical sense. Awesome. But the number one thing I would always tell most of my students here is the 33 is to always, always, always make sure you just change the units to be the same. Otherwise, you will get caught up into the answers if you do 8 by 3rd times 10 divided by 20 by 20. Um, there's other questions on that, too, asking like in square conversions, um, and that's just a lot to deal with, and I just use a sample number there. Um, but if you have a question on that, shoot me down in the comments and I can answer that there. Awesome. So 34 in a standard XY coordinate plane, a circle with its center 85 and a radius of nine coordinates has which of the following equations? So the biggest thing to note here is the equation of a circle by a coordinate plane. This is really just testing your knowledge. You have to remember it from your either pre-calc class, uh, trig, and or probably geometries when you saw it, maybe algebra too. But just a gentle reminder, you have, I'll write this in black. So you can remember it is x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared and in this case h and k are your centers your h k is your center oops re switch those two up your h k is your center and your r is your radius and so plugging these in if it has the center eight five it should be minus eight minus five so you should have x minus 8 squared plus y minus 5 squared. The way I like to remember it's kind of opposite. It's like what value would the y or x have to be to be 0? So it's 8, 5. And then that's equal to 9 squared, which is 81. So I'm looking through this. I should get rid of all the 9s because this should be 9 squared. And which one has the minus 5, minus 8? And that's only going to be f, right? Straightforward problem. Remember, all these problems are worth the same. And it really comes down to a little bit of content review. So if that was a little bit confusing, maybe just time to brush up a little bit of your geometry so it can help you a bit there. Awesome. So now we get to this part, 35 to 38. And when you're at this part, you kind of want to take a deep breath because that's when I feel like the transition hits a little harder. You're about halfway through the test and you get this big word problem. It usually has this little squares, like use the following information to do these like three, four problems. And it gives you a lot of stuff, right? Um, this also is starting a little bit when the questions pick up a little difficulty. So pat yourself on the back a little bit. You've done halfway through this test, but now really take a deep breath. Know the thing, know the challenge is coming up a little harder and you really just want to embrace that. So from here, um, then my number one thing for this is like most of this information is probably not that useful. You really just want to focus on the numbers. What is this about? And that's really when you're going to get the gist of it. Don't, this is not the reading section. It's the math section. So don't, hang on to every word um, very dearly because some of it really doesn't matter. So in this question, many humans carry the YQ77 gene. The YQ test determines with 100% accuracy whether a human carries YQ77. If a YQ test result is positive, the human carries the YQ77 gene. If a YQ test result is negative, the human does not carry the YQ77. Sam designed a less expensive test for the YQ77 called the SAM77 test. It produces some incorrect results, so that's probably important to know. To determine, to determine the accuracy of SAM 77 tests, both tests were administered to 1,000 volunteers. The results from the administration are on this table below. And you can see here, this, this kind of the overlap of positive, positive, negative tests, and so forth. Awesome. It costs $2,500 to administer each YQ test and $50 to administer the SAM 77 test. What was the total cost to administer the to all volunteers? So basically, how much did it cost to give these to both volunteers. Well, how many volunteers were there? There were a thousand and then it costs, you did both. So first you have 2,500 
times a thousand. That's 2.5 million. That's a lot of dough. And then the other one is $50 times a thousand. And that's just going to be 50,000. So adding them up, you should get $2,550,000. So obviously here, if it's 2,500 and you give it to a thousand volunteers, um, in that case, it's going to be that much money. And no, here you can see that how you can like get mixed up with the table. Right, it's not asking with the table. You don't have to worry about right now. That's separate. This one's just asking about how many volunteers were there. And there were a thousand. So these don't make any sense. And you're really just looking for that total for E. Perfect. Thirty-six. What percent of the volunteers actually carry Y seventy-seven? So this is now we're looking at the table and you're like, okay, what does this mean? Well, remember the positive YQ test is the ones that actually have the positive YQ, um, and then. The negative YQ test. So I really want to look at these because this is the one that's 100% accurate. Whereas this is where we're testing. This is where we're testing these results. So if I want to know how many volunteers actually carry Y77, I want to look at this. I don't care about the SAM77 at the moment because I know that's the one that's inaccurate. I want the one that has 100% accuracy, which is this guy. And so how many volunteers? There were 1,000. And then it's 590 plus the 25. Now, if you want to get into detail, what does that mean? This one means Sam has a negative result, but actually is positive. So that's a um, false negative in that case. And so adding this up, you have 615 over 1000, and that adds up to, and then that's 0.615. Remember it is percentage. So you multiply hundred percent and 61.5% will be that answer. Perfect. For 37, how many volunteers did Sam 70, Sam test give it incorrect result? So we have to think about which one's incorrect. Well, this is where we want to rely on this table, right? In this case, the good result is when it's positive and positive because that means it does the right thing. And then the negative, negative, negative result is a good thing. The bad ones are just want to contrast that YQ test because you know the YQ test has 100% accuracy. And the SAM 77 test is the one that produces those incorrect results. And so those inquiries that results would be these, the ones where SAM test, SAM 77 test negative, when it should be positive, and when it tests positive, when it should be negative. So here, that would be um, 25 plus the 10. And so that gets you a total of 35. This just seems kind of like a really bad test. Ideally, they could give you that. Um, but as you can see, there is a quite a bit of overlap between the positive and the negative test of it being somewhat efficable in that regard. Awesome. Let's move to question 38. One of the volunteers whose SAM 77 test result was positive will be chosen at random. To the nearest 0 0.001, what is the probability the chosen volunteer does not possess YQ 77? Okay, so we have to think about what are we trying to compare? So we wanna say does not possess YQ 77, which means it's negative, right? And this is one of the volunteers whose test result was positive. So SAM 77 tests, how many positive were there? Well, we have to add them up. There is the 590 here plus the 10. So the total on the bottom, how many test positive is 590 plus 10. And to the nearest point, what is probably it does not possess YQ 77. Well, that's the one that should have the negative YQ test. So that would be the 10. And so here you would be 10 over 600. Oops, so that's a 6,000. And then you want to use the calculator there to calculate that out. You can kind of estimate, I'm just pulling up my calculator here, kind of estimate it, it should be about point, well, it's 1% because one, 10 over 600 is quite small. And that would be equal to using calculus 0 0.0166. And then that just rounds up to 0 0.017. I remember you want it to not be that incorrect. So it should probably be a low percentage. And so this all logically makes sense. All right. Two more problems, and then we're all done with 31 to 40. So 39, this is a really big one. Matrices are a really big thing that they test on the ACT. But it says, given the matrices, x equals negative 1, 0, and y is negative 2, negative 1, which of the following matrices is x times y? Now, when you do <clears throat> multiplication of matrices, you always multiply by row, by column. So how this looks like if I have negative 1, 0, times negative two, negative one, I'll do a highlighter here. 
negative one multiplies to the negative two, and then zero multiplies by the negative one. And you do this for all rows and columns. If this doesn't make any sense, uh, please look up and review uh, multiply by matrices. I will do a little bit at the end just to kind of explain, but this is how you kind of want to set it up. And so here, when especially when you do this, you always do it by row by column to do the dimensions. This is a two by one matrix multiplied by a one by two, one row by two. And notice these, min sorry, I, I misspoke. This is a one by two, one row by two columns by a two by one, two rows and one column. And notice these middle numbers are always the same and the end numbers will be your dimensions. So I'm expecting a one by one matrix. And that's what I'm gonna get because I'm gonna multiply these. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get, it's gonna be negative one times negative two plus zero times negative one, that's just zero. So it's negative one times negative two, and I should just get positive two. And now that you see that here, that it's just a one by one matrix, but there will be later questions saying, are these matrices able to be multiplied? Um, what is the product of these matrices? Um, and that's just a good example. And just to give you a little aside, just so you have a quick review and you don't have to go somewhere else, but let's say I just have like a negative one zero times a one, two, three, four. So in this case, this is a one by two, remember, and this is a two by two. So these numbers are the same. So I'm expecting a one by two matrix. And so I'm gonna get here negative one times zero. This negative one goes to one, zero times three. That first one is going to be negative one. And then I get negative one times two, zero times four, be two. Notice I end up with a one by two matrix. Now that's really fast and really brief. You probably spent weeks on it in class to do it. Um, this was a really good aside because it's, it's a really high yield concept at this upper, at these upper level questions that you really want to, if you're trying to strive for a 30 plus that you really want to get down before you step into the exam. Awesome. Lastly, Morty, regardless of how the graph is oriented in a standard XY coordinate plane, no graph in one of the following categories has a vertical line of symmetry. Which one? You can just draw these and then you could help yourself through that. Um, but you can align, definitely has one. Just draw in here. So that's wrong. A square. Yeah, you could probably draw that. Good. A pentagon. You can draw a pentagon. Good. So you're good there. Now you have a parallelogram. And this could be a bit difficult to think about. I would just draw the shapes. So a parallelogram has two sides are the same and they're parallel and you can twist it to be somewhat um, similar. A scalene triangle on the other hand has three sides that are different. And by that logic, I would go with K. And if you try to do it and whatever, I would just do the one that's most logical. A scalene triangle is a triangle with three different lengths and sides. So if you were to draw a vertical line of symmetry, you'd be very hard pressed to compared to a parallelogram. Awesome. Well, that is questions 31 through 40. Ran through it quick. If there's any questions, please leave me a comment down below. Without, keep on grinding, take care, and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks.